A spring morning shattered without warning. He waited for her, he shot her right straight in the face, and he killed her. They said a, a woman has been shot. A loving wife. To my horror, it was Janie. And devoted mother. And I remember kind of just dropping to my knees at that point in time. The brutal murder so baffling, even seasoned investigators are running out of clues. There was never a reason that we could focus on, oh, this was the reason that she was killed. Nothing. The whole community was scared. This looked like a crime that was going to be very difficult to solve. Ten months later, another savage shooting with the same M.O. Lone male, black assailant, in the middle of the day, single shot to the face. A gruesome coincidence? This is not our guy. Or a serial killer on the loose? I was convinced I was missing something. Why did it happen? Where is he? I just wasn't putting the pieces together. What else can I do to try and find this guy? Two female investigators prepare to risk it all to bring the guilty to justice. My boss told me to let it go, but something about it kept grabbing at me. I just couldn't let it go. A 45-minute drive south from the hustle of Los Angeles lies the quiet bedroom community of Fountain Valley, a location favored by early settlers for its ancient artesian wells that offered clean, fresh water. The, the motto of the city is it's a nice place to live, and it is a nice place to live. The former agricultural community has become one of the wealthiest cities in America, a pretty and peaceful place for a family, like the Carvers. June 11, 1995, a sleepy Saturday morning. 48-year-old pharmacist Al Carver is slowly easing into his day, but his wife Janie is already on the go. She just got up and says, you know, I think I'll, I'll take a run this morning, and, and uh, and he says, uh, that's fine. I've got some bills to pay, and so stayed behind to do that. It was Al who had introduced Janie to jogging. The couple had even run marathons together. She was uh, shorter than I was, obviously, so she had to take more strides than I did. But she was tougher than I was in terms of uh, her stamina. On this morning, the 46-year-old mother of two is running her usual route through nearby Mile Square Park. A flight attendant since the age of 21, Janie spends much of her time in the air, which is why, on her days off, she likes nothing more than to have her feet on the ground, close to her sons Justin and his older brother Cliff. She was loving, she was reliable, but most of all, she was just really fun. A lot of positive energy, really, really, you know, vivacious and just a go-getter. She was truly a straight shooter. You always heard exactly how she felt. She had a little bit of the uh, Irish blood in her and had a lot of spunk, and uh, I think we all enjoyed that. She was very active with the boys in school and in, uh, in sports. She was athletic, and she truly did, had a lust for life. It is still early as Janie Carver heads for home. We wake up on a Saturday morning expecting it to be a, a, a normal day, I guess, and so I was at my desk drinking my coffee and uh, writing checks. No one notices the man in the white car parked close to the Carver's house. Unbeknownst to Janie, he is lying in wait for her. She is less than a block away as the killer moves to meet her. A neighbor hears her last frightened words. Janie said, no, please, no. The ruthless killer slips away as quietly as he came, while a horrified witness calls for help. 911 emergency? OK, 
calm down for me, okay? okay? Tell me what you saw. I saw, I heard a scream, I heard a shot, I turn around, I see somebody laying across the street and he has to take off. Okay, hold on the line for me, okay? okay. I was uh, drinking my coffee and I heard some uh, sirens. And so I, I went out to the street. I asked what happened, and uh, they said uh, a woman has been shot. She was lying on her back, uh, not moving at all. And uh, to my horror, it was Janie. She had been shot just below the left eye, the bullet severing her spinal cord. Paramedics rush her to the nearby hospital. I can recall sitting on the sidewalk and just sitting on the sidewalk and, uh, you know, trying to, to, to ask myself, well, you know, what had happened and why has this happened and how can something like this happen? It's homicide investigator Kim Brown's job to find out. I received a call from my lieutenant that there had been a shooting and she'd been transported to the hospital. It was just so unusual. Broad daylight, 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. Al returns home to break the gruesome news to their 14-year-old son. Justin was uh, sleeping. I just says, wake up, Justin. We, you know, we, we have to go. I uh, have to go to the hospital. Your mother's been shot. And uh, so that's, you know, just horribly uh, alarming and, and, and scary. Eldest son Cliff is a state away attending university in Portland, Oregon. He just, uh, you know, he said, you know, Cliff, your mom's been shot. Um, you need to come home. Um, and I remember kind of just dropping to my knees at that point in time. The entire family is in a state of bewilderment and shock. They escorted me into the exam room uh, in which they were attending to Janie. And uh, it was pretty obvious that this was a devastating uh, shot. And so it gave me a few seconds to say my goodbyes. And then, uh, you know, they, uh, <clears throat> and that was it. She's dead. Flight attendant and mother of two, Janie Carver, is dead. Shot in the face at point blank range as she returns from a run through her Fountain Valley, California neighborhood. Her family is devastated. Within the, the course of a, a minute, your, your whole life is uh, turned upside down. Even seasoned police are shocked by the brutal nature of the crime. When I got to the hospital, Jane had already been pronounced dead. There was still all the medical apparatus on her. But I saw the gunshot. I saw the, the entrance and the exit. It was right under the left eye. It was at fairly close range. Just the angle of the shot and everything in all appearances, the intention was to kill her. But who was the shooter? And why was Janie Carver the target? Kim Brown joins Detective Bob Mosley at the crime scene to search for vital clues. We had one shell casing that we had recovered. Uh, it was from uh, an automatic. It was probably a nine millimeter. But other than that, we had no other physical evidence at the scene. The remainder of the recovered items are Janie's, remnants of the final terrifying moments of her life. She had her sunglasses. Uh, they had been broken. There was her headphones. There wasn't much at the crime scene to go on. Police hope the now blood-soaked clothing she was wearing might offer up more. DNA, blood, any sort of transfer from the suspect. But the tests come up negative, leaving police with no leads. Officers canvas the Carver's Fountain Valley neighborhood for witnesses, while Detective Brown focuses in on those who knew Janie best. Commonly, this type of crime, it's close to home. So you have to look at everybody as a potential suspect, and you can't rule anybody out, whether it's husband, family, or friends. First, they interviewed me, and then I realized they will have to talk to Al, and they will have to see him as a suspect. Janie's husband, Al, is brought into the police station for questioning. You have to continue to work the case to a point where you feel that you can eliminate someone. 
While Brown interviews family and friends, the officers on the ground are trying to piece together the brutal event. Where she was shot is actually a street that is heavy as far as traffic wise. So we had some people that were actually in vehicles that also witnessed it. They tell police they saw a black man carrying a gun approach the jogger on the sidewalk. I just can't imagine what Janie's last moments were like, how terrified she was. According to witnesses at the scene, when they heard a gunshot. She falls to the pavement, and then he nonchalantly walks back to a car. One of the witnesses described it as a, a small, white, compact-type car. But getting a detailed description of the assailant's face is much more difficult. Someone had observed the suspect from the side, and that was it. Police create a composite drawing from the witnesses' descriptions. We did flyer campaigns. We had mailer efforts. We had over 100 volunteers that somehow knew of Jane Carver, were friends of Jane Carver, or relatives of Jane Carver. I think, in the end, passed out 250,000 flyers all over Orange County. Despite the community's best efforts, no one comes forward to identify the mysterious man. It's like, what else can we do? And I'm sure the police felt the same way. In fact, police were deeply troubled by Janie Carver's execution-style murder and frustrated by their inability to solve it. It's difficult when months go by and you still have a whodunit. Janie's family and friends have all been cleared as suspects in her death with the exception of Al Carver. Why had the man who often accompanied his wife on her run not gone with her that particular morning? Could it be that he had reason to want her dead? You look at their financial background. We look at the marriage. You look at life insurance policies. We look at if there's any possibility of affairs. You look at any gain that anyone would have had from her death. It had become clear that there was no evidence linking L towards anything. And it doesn't mean that my coworkers believed it. Of course, the general public probably didn't think so. There's one last thing to do to eliminate Al Carver as a suspect, and that is to give him a polygraph. Police wire up Al Carver five long months after his wife's horrible death. It was the day before Thanksgiving, and, and uh, it was really upsetting for me that I would be subjected to a polygraph test. He passed the polygraph. He was not a suspect in his wife's murder. I just uh, had um, no idea of why anyone would want to kill Janie. The reward fund for information leading to the killer's arrest continues to rise. It grew to uh, $50,000, ultimately. And police hope the new face-on composite of Janie's killer will produce someone who can identify him. But with each passing day and no sign of an arrest, the Fountain Valley community grows increasingly impatient. It will make me angry that someone could do something so callous and get away with it. It would have made Janie angry. I know it would have. I thought about the case every single day. Why did it happen? Where is he? What else can I do to try and find this guy? Beloved wife and mother, Janie Carver, is shot at point-blank range as she jogs through her Fountain Valley neighborhood on the outskirts of Los Angeles. Months later, not only do police have no suspects in their sights, they have no motive for her murder. This just didn't happen in Fountain Valley. We didn't have this type of crime. A 40-minute drive from Fountain Valley lies the oceanside city of San Clemente, California. The picturesque community was once the site of President Richard Nixon's vacation home, and it remains renowned for its beautiful beaches and temperate climate. It is April 10th, 1996, nine months after the killing of Janie Carver. Businessman James Wengert parks his car in the garage of his downtown office building, oblivious to the armed man who is hurrying to intercept him. 
as the 48-year-old investment researcher makes his way toward the exit, the shooter moves into position, then just steps from the stairwell. Orange County Captain Christine Murray is called in to investigate the shooting, but the details are scarce. A businessman in San Clemente was being treated for a uh, gunshot wound to the face. By the time Murray reaches the hospital, there is good news. Unlike Janie Carver, James Wengert will survive. He had clearly suffered a significant injury to the side of his face, swollen in the jaw, the neck, and up to his eye socket. We were amazed he was alive. More amazing still, the injured man was able to go looking for help after outwitting his attacker. When Wingert was shot, he dropped immediately to the ground and made a very quick decision that probably saved his life to just play dead and not let on that he had survived the shot to the head. James Wengert was smart, but he was also very lucky. The bullet struck a significant portion of a dental implant, the bridge work, and it caused the bullet to fragment. The round did not penetrate into his brain. With the victim out of commission, Murray looks to the crime scene for clues. There was no video evidence, no independent witnesses of the event. And there was some blood evidence and a shell casing. Other than that, really very little to go on. At first glance, it appears to be a robbery turned violent. But the experienced investigator thinks otherwise. No one took his car keys. His office was nearby. His car was within just a few feet of where he had been shot. This looked like a crime that was going to be very difficult to solve. Murray decides to pay victim James Wingert another visit. This time, he is able to tell her that his assailant was a black male and a stranger. But it's what Wingert mentions next that most piques Murray's interest. He began to tell us about a business dealing that he had with a company called Premium Commercial and a very antagonistic relationship he developed with the owner, Cole Allen. Premium Commercial, headquartered in an Orange County strip mall, lends money to businesses short of cash. Murray learns that company owner Cole Allen is already under investigation by another police force. As we began to investigate Cole Allen and his business dealings, we started to encounter other law enforcement agencies that had dealt with him regarding assaults. He was a man in his uh, mid to late 50s. Uh, big frame man. He was an immaculate dresser, but he was very intimidating. He was verbally abusive to most of these people who had borrowed money from him. But police believe Allen was a lot more than just abusive. He would require the borrower to take a life insurance policy out, listing Cole Allen as a beneficiary. And those policies are well in excess of the money the borrower owes so that if they died, he would collect that money. But could Cole Allen have murdered clients in order to collect? And was that the plan for James Wengert? Murray learns Wengert owed Premium Commercial $200,000, but his life was insured for $600,000. Reason enough to bring Cole Allen in for questioning. We love an interview. You want to get someone in the chair and talk to them and see what they say. Cole Allen was certainly our primary focus. We wanted to talk to him. There's just one problem. Cole Allen died of a heart attack three days before James Wengert was shot. There was um, one of our first hurdles. This looked like a very good lead, but he had been dead. So if Cole Allen hadn't pulled the trigger on James Wengert, had he hired someone to do it before he died? We began uh, a very arduous process of examining his life and his business to see if we could identify who the shooter might be. Starting with an actual search of Allen's company. As well as multiple search warrants on every telephone that we knew he used. You start looking for common numbers, common names, or something unusual, a cash payment uh, without an invoice. 
10 months after the cold-blooded killing of flight attendant and mother of two, Janie Carver, Fountain Valley, California police haven't got a single lead. The whole community was scared. Uh, this didn't happen in our community, and if it could happen to Jane, it could happen to me. Unbeknownst to Brown and her fellow investigators, a similar execution-style shooting has just happened a 40-minute drive south in the town of San Clemente. But this time, the victim, businessman James Winkert, survives. We don't investigate a lot of cases where people are shot in the head and, and survive or are able to talk to us. Wengert tells police that he believes the man responsible for the attempt on his life is ruthless loan shark Cole Allen. Allen is already under investigation by another police force for a suspected sinister lending scheme. Cole made money by lending money the borrower couldn't pay back and then taking life insurance policies out on them, listing Cole Allen as a beneficiary. Police believe Allen was then having those borrowers killed and collecting on their life insurance, receiving well in excess of the money the client owed. But with Allen dead of a heart attack, police need a paper trail to prove their theory. And a search of his business, Premium Commercial, turns up no concrete evidence of any deadly conduct. I think it was frustrating for everyone that had been investigating Cole Allen. This was who you wanted to hold accountable for what had occurred. Then, just as Murray is running out of leads, she hears a casual remark that captures her attention. My lieutenant made a comment that the only time he could remember a black suspect shooting a white victim in Orange County was that case last year in Fountain Valley. And those similarities were a lone male black assailant, a single shot to the face in the middle of the day, and both victims were white. So could there be a link between Janie Carver's murder and James Wengard's attempted murder? Could Cole Allen have contracted both? Murray contacts Fountain Valley detectives. They readily met with me and were excited that there was just something new to discuss and hopeful that it might lead somewhere. Now we're starting to say, maybe this is our guy. And just maybe the reason Mr. Winkert was shot was the reason that Jane Carver may have been shot. But despite the similarities between the two cases, their hopes are soon dashed. Police can find no connection between Janie Carver and James Winkert or Cole Allen. I was disappointed, but the reaction of the Fountain Valley detectives was, was very difficult to watch. They were very disappointed. It's difficult when you have a high profile case and the case isn't solved. And you want everybody to know that you're really good at taking care of crime in your city. They wish me luck on my investigation and I wish them luck on theirs, uh, but we separated our cases and moved on. Now, both investigations are at a virtual standstill. It's very frustrating when you don't have workable leads, but I've also learned that Sometimes time is your, also your best weapon. Two weeks later, Murray's patience pays off big in the form of an unexpected phone call from an unlikely source. The Sheriff's Department was contacted by Cole Allen's widow and reported a male subject was claiming to have killed someone at Cole Allen's direction. It was apparent to us that the subject thought he had killed Wingert and he wanted to be paid. Finally, the break Christine Murray has been desperate for, evidence that Cole Allen had hired hitmen to kill his borrowers, including James Wengert. Fearing for her own life, Cole Allen's wife Barbara had hired a private investigator to deal with the unknown caller. Okay, you want to meet the Home Depot parking lot? Sure. Home Depot parking lot. Right. The P.I. had someone surreptitiously videotape his parking lot meeting with the caller. The guy identified himself as Paula Lean and said he was acting as a middleman for the actual killer of James Wingert. So just pay him the money and he would take care of making sure the bad guys went away. Christine Murray believes Paula Lean is Wingert's attempted murderer, not just a middleman. If I had killed someone, I'm not going to have other people go collect money for me. I'm just going to go get the money. 
Um, so none of that made sense. But for police to arrest Paula Lean, they'll need James Wenger to identify him as his shooter. Investigators include Aline's mugshot in a photo lineup and pay a late night visit to the victim's home. I believe it was around three in the morning and showed him the lineup. We were a little concerned that he might be sleepy or tired, but he was very, uh, very much awake. When you do these, a lot of times they'll, they'll touch the, the photograph. Number five. Can identify photograph number five as the suspect? Yes. And he positively identified Paul Lean as the man who shot him. And on April 23rd, 1995, police arrest the unsuspecting Aline, then mount a search of his property. He was wearing certain clothing at the time of the crime. You look for that. There was a gun used, so you're looking for that. Police find only a gun cleaning kit and no link between Paul Aline and James Wingert. If the 29-year-old Aline is their hitman, he's not admitting to it. I told you, I've never shot anybody in the face. I've never been a single He had initially told the private investigator that he was just the guy collecting the money for the shooter. I was just a little push around boy for gold. But as the interview wears on, Aline slips up. He made the comment that all black men must look the same to an old white guy. And that struck an immediate chord with us as we had never described James Wingert to Paula Lean. And so the only way he would have known he was an old white guy was if he had in fact been the shooter. Orange County police have arrested Paul Aline, the man they believe was hired by loan shark Cole Allen to shoot San Clemente businessman James Wengert. Detective Christine Murray suspects there might be a link between Wengert's attempted murder and the brutal killing of Janie Carver 10 months earlier. But Fountain Valley police can find no connection. In his interview with investigators, Aline admits to knowing Cole Allen, but maintains he had nothing to do with the hit on James Wengert. I told you, I never shot anybody in the face. I've never been a single man. Aline insisted throughout the interview that he had shot no one, he was a, not a violent guy. But Aline incriminates himself by providing police with information only Wengert's shooter would know. And Christine Murray, having got the evidence she needs, leaves her partner to finish up the interview. Still, Murray can't shake the feeling that the Wingard shooting is somehow connected to Janie Carver's killing. I would say it was as a hunch, and, and you get these throughout your police career, and you don't want to rationalize things away. You want to, to prove them false or positive. The next day, she again contacts the Fountain Valley Police Department. We weren't sure what the connection was to Jane. All we had were the witnesses that came forward in the beginning. Christine Murray gave us a mugshot, which we looked at and go, mm, probably not. Aline's photo bears little resemblance to the composite of Janie Carver's killer. But just to be sure, we went down to Orange County Jail saw him in person, and we both kind of looked at each other and said, no, this is not our guy. It was frustrating. We had, through the Wingard investigation, been exposed to this web of evil. There was a thought that this evil was what had occurred in Fountain Valley and that, you know, maybe we would solve it. And having all those possibilities eliminated was very frustrating. A week goes by, and Murray is comparing the taped Paul Aline interview to the transcript to be presented at trial. You're looking for the, the nuances and the details in someone's words to fill in the blanks that the transcriber left. Close to the end of the tape, when Murray had left Mark Simon to finish up the interview. When's the last time you talked to us? Monday. And Paul Aline said something about Cole Allen being mad at Leonard or Leonard Monday for shooting the wrong person. I shot the wrong person once or something like that. I did not know anything about another crime that we were looking at. So at the time, I didn't think anything of it. And since Leonard Mundy is not a name known to police, Simon made a note of it and moved on. But Christine Murray is all ears. 
You shot the wrong person once or something. Leonard shot the wrong guy once. It was like, <laughs> well, wait a minute. I, who did he shoot? We've got to find out who that person was. Could it be Janie Carver? You shot the wrong person once. I had this sense that I was missing something, that I hadn't quite connected all the dots or put all the pieces together. Murray learns that Leonard Mundy is an electrician and father of two, hardly the profile of a cold-blooded killer. But if Mundy is not their murderer, can he help them solve the Carver killing? Murray needs to find him and find out. And so I began to look in other areas of Orange County, as well as the adjoining counties, Los Angeles in particular. But before she can make any headway, Murray's Orange County boss tells her that with the suspect in the Wingert shooting in custody, she needs to leave the Carver case to the Fountain Valley police. For Christine Murray, that's easier said than done. And it's hard to explain why something just keeps tugging at you. And so I didn't let it go. Working on the Janie Carver murder in her free time, Murray comes across a strange coincidence. Going through my notes and records, I realized that the Wingerts used to live in Fountain Valley. In fact, at the time of Janie Carver's murder, the Wingerts lived just a seven minute drive from the Carver's home. Could there be a connection? I decided I'm gonna drive by the Wingert house and take a look. Police believe that deceased loan shark Cole Allen hired hitman Paul Aline to kill businessman James Wengert. In his interview, Aline let slip the name Leonard Mundy, a man he says Cole Allen was angry with for having made a fatal mistake. You shot the wrong person once or something like that. I tried to get some of the details, but he didn't have any, only that Cole Allen was mad at Leonard for shooting the wrong person. When lead investigator Christine Murray learns of Aline's comment, she wonders whether Leonard Mundy might have also been hired by Cole Allen as a second hitman. We've got to find out who that person was. Can we link Leonard Mundy to a murder? And was the victim Janie Carver, the mother of two brutally murdered 10 months earlier? In her effort to connect the two cases, Murray decides to take a drive past James Wengert's former Fountain Valley residence. When I got off the freeway at Brookhurst to do that, I discovered that the freeway off ramps were a little confusing. Instead of a straight off, there was a big clover leaf. And when I got off the freeway, I found myself on Brookhurst, uh, heading in the direction that Jane Carver lived. A simple wrong turn off the highway has taken Murray north to the Carvers rather than off the Cloverleaf and south to the home of James Wengert and his wife. Had the man who killed Janie Carver made the same mistake? And if so, who was his real target? Again, I went back to the records and I discovered that James Wengert's wife was involved in a very contentious legal dispute with Cole Allen. Margaret Wengert was suing Cole Allen for threatening to foreclose on the Wengert's home in order to collect on the money James Wengert owed him. And that lawsuit had come to a head. Mrs. Wengert was due in court to testify against Cole Allen just a few days after Jane Carver was murdered. And so I began to think that maybe Margaret Wengert was the target of that shooting. And instead of shooting Margaret Wingert, someone shot Jane Carver. Both women frequented the park near their homes. Both were white and middle-aged. Were those similarities enough to further confuse the killer? Murray returns to drive the route. I did it again and again, and I got back on the freeway and went northbound and doubled back and got off the freeway again to see if my confusion was just because I wasn't paying attention or could someone not familiar with the area make the same mistake. It started making sense to me that if you got turned around but were following someone else's directions, you could have ended up where Jane Carver was shot when you meant to be at the Wingert house. Murray shares her startling mistaken identity theory with Fountain Valley detectives. 
when I heard all the theory and everything put together, it was the answers started coming. What was important is that it, it gave why he did and why he went where. But is he Leonard Mundy? Leonard Mundy's background was not a violent man, but an abuser of drugs and alcohol. Heavily into drugs, heavily into cocaine. Business was going bankrupt. Was he desperate enough to kill for Cole Allen and strung out enough to mistake Janie Carver as his target? With the loan shark dead, detectives need to find someone else from the lending company who will open up the books. Trouble is, police don't have a search warrant. So, <laughs> just decided to bogart our way in and see what happens. <laughs> Their visit to Premium Commercial unearths a clear paper trail between the lending company and hitman Paul Aline, hired to kill businessman James Wengert. But what Mosley and his partner can't find is any evidence of a link between the loan company and suspected hitman Leonard Mundy. Just as the investigators seem about to admit defeat, Mosley takes a final crack at getting a Premium Commercial employee to dig deeper. I ask him, is there another contract like Paul Lane's? And if not, I'll be back with a search warrant and I'll have an officer stay here until we find out. He went absolutely white. Sits back down in the chair. He says, well, in a whisper, I have been looking at the contracts and I found one. He goes to his bottom drawer, picks out a contract in the name of Mundy. Concrete evidence of a relationship between loan shark Cole Allen and Leonard Mundy, the man police believe killed Janie Carver. And attached to the contract, Detective Mosley and his partner spot a photograph of Mundy. And we both get a case of the big eyes. I know this is our guy. They include Leonard Mundy in a photo lineup and show that to their best eyewitness to Janie Carver's murder. But nearly a year after the shooting, can he still recall the killer's face? And is it Leonard Mundy's? Uh, later that afternoon, I was still at my desk and Bob Mosley called me on the phone and Bob was crying. Bob said he picked him out. He picked him out. He picked Leonard Monday out. That's who killed Jane Carver. Yeah, we were both, both very, <clears throat> just very emotional. The following day, heavily armed police arrive at Leonard Monday's door. They did the knock, talk, arrest, search. It was all done in a minute and 30 seconds. The first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to see the person that was responsible for all the heartache and the grief that he caused to all the victims, family, and friends in the community. Detectives have arrested Leonard Mundy, the man suspected of killing flight attendant and mother Janie Carver in a tragic case of mistaken identity. Mundy matches the composite drawing, but is he their man? Investigators interview him to find out. Why does he give you 30 grand? He gives me the money, I give it back. Yeah, but why? Mundy admits to knowing moneylender Cole Allen, but denies working as a hitman for him. I haven't shot anybody. That I can say with well, I, 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 I'd like to believe you, but I don't. Detectives on the case aren't buying it. There was a profile portion of the composite that I was struck by not only the hairline being very accurate, but also the shadows in the jawline. I showed him the composite. He said, yeah, that's me. I mean, he, he said, oh, yeah, that's me. And so that's when he started talking about, well, I want a lie detector test. I'll show you I didn't do it. Though not admissible in a court of law, a polygraph helps investigators know if they're on the right track. 
And according to the man who'd administered it, he came to me and says, you know, I seldom get one that is this positive. There's no doubt in my mind that this is your killer. Flunked it big time. It made everything seem worthwhile that I had done in the last few weeks. But their case could completely fall apart unless witnesses to Carver's gruesome murder identify Mundy in an in-person lineup. It's absolutely essential for court. We put Leonard in a lineup with five other men, all similar description. Each witness is given a, a slip of paper to secretly write down the person they identify if they're able to identify someone. Every one of them uh, independently picked out Leonard Monday as Jane Carver's killer. We finally have the person responsible for Jane's death. People were hugging one another, very congratulatory. But it also brought home a somber feeling about why we were there. And a lot of people began to express um, very heartfelt um, thoughts and memories about Jane Carver. Bob Mosley delivers the bittersweet news to Janie's husband. After, you know, wondering for many months, um, then uh, the day has finally happened, and uh, your, uh, your hope has finally uh, been realized. We both cried like hell. <laughs> I still get emotional from it. How can you not only kill someone, kill the wrong person? I, you know, I, how, how can anybody um, comprehend what happened? I think a uh, inept, inexperienced killer, under either the promise of money or the threats of Cole Allen, uh, went to Found Valley uh, to kill a woman, and he killed the wrong woman. It's sad. It's incredibly sad that. It had to happen at all. The court cases confirm that both Leonard Mundy and Paul Aline were hired to kill by Cole Allen in exchange for wiping out their debts to premium commercial. Paul Aline is found guilty of the attempted murder of James Wengert and sentenced to 29 years in prison. For the murder of Janie Carver, Leonard Mundy will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Cases solved. Jane isn't going to come back, but Jane, Jane's in everybody's heart and always will be. Lieutenant Kim Brown was honored by the Carver family for her part in finding Janie's killer. Captain Christine Murray received the Orange County Sheriff's Medal of Merit. I wonder if I hadn't gone southbound on that 405 freeway that day, if I would have ever said, put Leonard in a photo lineup. Yeah.